All right, this is chapter 18, the Progressive Era. And this is the time period 1900 to 1916 when World War I was beginning. And the aims of the progressives were to fix the problems of the Gilded Age. So we're going to have uh, tremendous achievements in this era. They're not going to fix all the problems. In fact, they'll make some problems even worse. But there will be a lot of uh, achievements that, that must be acknowledged. Um, here we see an image of the overcrowded uh, tenements of New York City. Um, just one of the many, many issues of the era. And a horrible image of the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire uh, in 1911, which resulted in the deaths of close to 150 women and uh, exposed the, the terrible problems that were apparent in the workplace. Uh, these women were locked into, uh, into a room. Uh, fire erupted. The ladders of the of the fire trucks did not reach the upper floors where the fire raged and uh, many many uh, women leapt to their deaths rather than um, burned to death in the fires one of the worst tragedies in new york city history so in this period we're going to see a huge influx of immigrants so these new immigrants are still rolling in uh, many from south and eastern europe uh, countries like italy and and uh, the Austro-Hungarian Republic, a lot of Jews escaping from Russia, 13 million immigrants in total are going to flow through the United States in this time period. Ellis Island was the main facility to process these immigrants. Over on the West Coast, we're going to see a huge amount flowing through San Francisco and Angel Island. And by 1910, one out of seven people in America were foreign-born, including 40% of the New York City population itself. Here's an Italian family on a ferry boat leaving Ellis Island, hoping for opportunities for, um, for success here in this, in this new world. Uh, this table here shows immigrants and their children um, as a percentage of the population uh, in 10 major cities. And we, we could just see the sheer number of people, three quarters of the people in New York, Cleveland, Boston, Chicago, all over 70%, um, just tremendous time period. In this image here, we can see the, the millions and millions of, of people uh, transporting across the globe, not just to the United States, but to Southeast Asia, to Australia, South America, on and on. So when the immigrants arrived here in the United States, oftentimes they settled in, in neighborhoods where they could find uh, you know, family members, uh, people from the old world. Um, so they, these were close-knit ethnic neighborhoods. They had their own businesses, their own community organizations, so their same language was spoken there, their same food, um, customs, foreign language newspaper, uh, and churches were central to these communities as well. However, these immigrants, once arriving in America, faced long hours, low wages, dangerous working conditions, just like the rest of the Americans, and they toiled in the mines, the factories, and the fields. So we're going to have a group of people known as the muckrakers, and these journalists um, wrote about the, the horrible problems uh, throughout the United States. Were they doing it for selfish reasons, to sell magazines, to make money, or were they simply trying to um, showcase to the world the horrors of, of the United States? Um, we don't know, but they're exposing the problems of industrial and urban existence. Uh, Lincoln Steffens wrote about political corruption, the party bosses, the businessmen who dominated the Gilded Age. Uh, Ida Tarbell's father was driven out of uh, business by uh, John Rockefeller, so her expose in the Standard Oil Company really shed him in a, in a bad light. And Upton Sinclair's uh, novel, The Jungle, um, actually the aim, was, aim of it was to promote socialism. Um, and he aimed for the heart, but he actually... Uh, struck the mouth because people were horrified at the meatpacking conditions um, which were exposed in, in Sinclair's work, The Jungle. Uh, we're going to see a consumer society emerging in the progressive era. Um, Henry Ford is going to revolutionize production and the marketing of automobiles. Um, we're going to hear a new term, Fordism, which is the economic system based on mass production and mass consumption. The Model T, which was not the best car in the world, but it was affordable for many workers, which was key, and also affordable to the American public. Ford paid his workers well, $5 a day, which was the most of any factory in the country. But he also hired spies and armed detectives to make sure that workers kept from unionizing. 
Um, he also introduced the assembly line for the automobile, which allowed for these, this massive uh, production of, of the car. Here's the Model T's right here. And the sales of passenger cars is just going to, to go up incrementally. You know, 4.1 thousand in 1900. Um, that number will go up six times, uh, five years later, and on and on. So socialism will evolve in this time period in the, uh, in, in the industrial era. And the, uh, over in Europe it's starting and it's spreading to the United States, socialism and communism. Uh, the Socialist Party was founded in 1901. And they called for immediate reforms like free college, uh, laws to improve the working conditions, uh, public ownership of the railroad and factories, um, so they want to break up the trusts that were controlling it. And uh, by 1912, there were 150,000 members, uh, published hundreds of newspapers, had the support of the AFL. Uh, Eugene Debs, we talked about him earlier, uh, the leader of the Pullman strike back in 1894, uh, when he was jailed, he became... Uh, a devout socialist and in 1912 he actually received six percent of the vote in, in that election which was a four-way election um, so there's an image of Deb speaking to a crowd um, and as we can see socialist towns and cities will spring up in, in the two dec first two decades of the 20th century so socialism will have a tremendous mark on America in this time period today Canada and, and most of Europe are, are socialist uh, countries um, and many Americans today embrace socialism as well. Uh, the AFL, we've talked about that, 1.6 million members. And uh, this was an organization of skilled laborers. And the idea was if these laborers are skilled and they unionize, um, there's a better chance for them to, to gain uh, what they're desiring, higher wages, better hours, since they're essential workers. The IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, uh, basically, we'll take anybody not part of the AFL. So not only was it a union, it was also a revolutionary organization. Um, they want to dedicate. They dedicated themselves to seizing the means of production and abolishing the state. So they want to organize all the workers who were excluded from the AFL. That's my dog Max. Make it a film here, buddy. Calm down. And um, a lot of these ideas are, are central to communism today. Here's an image of the IWW. Kind of looks like me with a shirt off. Um, so we're going to have new immigrants on strike in this, in this time period. Uh, the IWW would often run the strikes. Um, they're going to win the Lawrence, Massachusetts strike in 1912, despite the militia and police uh, attacking them. Uh, we're going to have the Ludlow Massacre two years later, uh, where the United Mine Workers, 30 were killed, and uh, they were forced out of their homes and they were living in, in tents and uh, they were attacked by the by the uh, militia and 30 of them were killed. Um, workers were not free to speak out without being fired at this time and the IWW is going to wage um, free speech fights and they will literally send thousands of people to speak forcing local governments to arrest everybody and eventually the government could not simply arrest that many people which uh, helped them get their way. Um, here's an image of uh, striking New York City garment workers. And a couple of years before the Triangle Fire of 1911, these are New York shirtwaist uh, workers striking as well. So, progressive democracy. The 17th Amendment will be passed, a, a tremendous achievement of the, of the progressives, and that uh, called for the direct election of the Senate instead of uh, state legislatures choosing, now the entire uh, populace of a state can choose their own senators. Uh, popular election of judges uh, came, came to fruition. Uh, primary elections of candidates, so people um, will have opportunities to vote for um, who they want to be the candidate for the, for the November elections. Um, again, you'd, instead of the uh, party bosses choosing. The initiative was started where voters can propose their own ideas for a law and a referendum where voters instead of the legislature the voters the people can vote directly on a proposal and the idea of a recall was was started up if an official was doing a poor job before their election was up a special election could be called and they have a chance to 
vote them out of office. Uh, and also we're going to have the 19th Amendment, which finally, after, what, 130 some odd years, women were given the right to vote across the country. Here's a 1912 Women's Suffrage Parade in New York City. Uh, Jane Addams, who, was a, who fought for immigrants, uh, founded Hull House in Chicago in 1889. And this was a settle, settlement house dedicated to improving the lives of the immigrant poor. So settlement house workers are going to build and run schools, set up employment bureaus, health clinics, um, help out women who were victims of domestic abuse and children that were affected. And by 1910, 400 of these houses had been established across the nation. Here's a staff member greeting an immigrant family at Hull House. On to the progressive presidents. Uh, there's three of them. Teddy Roosevelt was the first, and uh, his presidency became the model for the 20th century president. A president actively involved, and not these laid-back types of the late 1800s who didn't really do too much that was memorable. Uh, continuously involved in domestic affairs and foreign policy, and they're going to set the political agenda for the nation. Roosevelt believed in the square deal. Okay, so he distinguished between good and bad trusts. If he believed a trust was good and it wasn't uh, taking advantage of the people, he'd leave it alone. If it was a bad trust, like J.P. Morgan's Northern Securities Company, Roosevelt went after it. And Roosevelt believed in, in the, the notion that everybody was entitled to, uh, to free opportunities in this country. Here's an image of Roosevelt uh, addressing a crowd in 1902. Roosevelt's the youngest president in history, 42 years old when he took office after William McKinley was assassinated. Here's a political cartoon putting the screws on him, and this is a 1904 uh, cartoon where they're breaking up J.P. Morgan's trust, and you can see Roosevelt uh, beaming gleefully in the, in the background. Roosevelt's the first American president to actually listen to both sides in a strike instead of just siding with management. Uh, with with the with the business owners, he he brought union leaders and managers to the White House, and he's going to work on uh, work on settling the strike with the commission, threaten to send in troops, and uh, Roosevelt is going to support economic regulation. So the Interstate Commerce Commission uh, will have the power to set railroad rates, which was a big issue in the Gilded Age, and this was a step towards giving the government uh, the regulatory power it has today. And Roosevelt was a big outdoorsman, and he's going to have a conservation movement, um, which will help establish uh, a policy at, in protecting America's beauty, particularly out west. Get out of here, you. Here's an image of Roosevelt at the Glacier Point. William Howard Taft was a good friend of Roosevelt. Um, he was a, an Ohio judge, became governor of the Philippines during the Philippine-American War. And he was Roosevelt's hand-picked successor um, to lead the progressive movement. He's going to defeat William Jennings Bryan in 1908. And he busted up even more trust than Roosevelt. Uh, he convinced the Supreme Court to attack uh, Rockefeller's Standard Oil Trust. And he supported the 16th Amendment, a progressive income tax on the wealthy. The election of 1912, uh, Roosevelt and, and Taft will have a falling out. Uh, Taft will be the Republican candidate. Roosevelt the newly formed progressive uh, bull moose party. The Democratic candidate was Woodrow Wilson, so all three are progressives, and Eugene Debs, the socialist. Uh, Wilson endorses a platform that's antitrust. Um, he supported the workers' rights for unions, uh, supported small businesses, and did not want to increase government regulation of the economy, and that's where he, he differed from, from Roosevelt predominantly. In this divided election, since the Republican Party did split, Roosevelt was a former Republican, Taft was the, the current one, Wilson's going to win the election. But you can see each of the four candidates, all strong candidates, um, are going to, to gain a significant number of votes. Uh, Wilson's first term, uh, he's going to help reduce tariffs, the, uh, more of a tax on the wealthy, the Clayton Act, which exempted unions from antitrust laws, um, big crowning achievement, the Federal Reserve System. So the government is going to regulate um, banks um, with currency. They're going to help failing banks, uh, help influence interest rates. Um, 
And a huge achievement is going to be ending child labor.